This is the London Air on RTE 2XM. My name's Nessie and today I am delighted to be joined by a gentleman who I saw on the stage. That was the first time that I I had seen him or heard of him or anything. And he blew me away in um, a production of Chasing Bono that was happening up in the Soho Theatre. I think it was a couple of years ago. It was like two days before Christmas and it was a Christmas that we had chosen not to go home. So it could be three years ago, maybe at this stage. And um, I'm delighted to be joined by Niall McNamee, Niall, actor, singer, all round footballer and talented guy. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm not bad. I'm not bad. So how's life been with you? All good, thanks. Yeah, it's two years ago now. Well, I suppose, yeah, it was around December, so just over two years ago. Um, and uh, I can't believe it, where the time's gone. Um, and that was a hell of a moment. Uh, lockdown's been okay, to be honest. Um, it's been all right. I came out to the countryside here Uh on St. Patrick's Day because my gig was cancelled and I thought, well, lockdown's going to be a couple of weeks. I may as well spend it in the countryside and uh, I've been here ever since now. <laughs> so it's been all right. Not the worst place in the world to be. So you got out of London for lockdown. So that was pretty OK. Yeah, it was all right. I mean, as I said, I had a, I had a, a big gig planned and uh, I'd signed with me first music manager in the February, a month before it. And I was thinking, right, we're going to really kick on now. And, you know, St. Patrick's Day gigs would be the the bigger ones. We had the Bedford sold out. And the day before we were rehearsing and um, I was practicing with the lads and and we we were sort of saying, oh, well, if it goes ahead at all, my fiddle player had been on some retreat for a couple of weeks and hadn't ever heard of COVID and was like, oh, what are you talking about? It'll never get cancelled. We went for a pint after rehearsals. And then I remember seeing a, a train load of people coming off the tube who'd been let go and the West End went dark and it felt like the world was coming to an end and then the gig got cancelled and you know I said to Imelda uh, you know what are we doing and and she went well if it's going to be closed we might as well be together on St Patrick's Day so I remember arriving at the train station and then I know it sounds stereotypical but this mad panic as we realised that because people talked about the toilet rolls going missing very yeah. quickly but what no one talked about on the 17th of march that year was the guinness we couldn't find a can anywhere luckily we found this little old shop in the middle of nowhere that hadn't uh people hadn't caught on to and uh we stocked up and had a great night wow it's it's crazy it, it I, it's strange now that we seem to be kind of hopefully fingers crossed coming out of all this um it, it is a different time. It's definitely one that they're going to be talking about, like the Spanish flu of 1980 and they're going to be talking coronavirus oh, yeah. like in 2020. Um, mm. And it's it's strange how it has affected different people in different ways. Um, how has it affected your creativity? Did, did you did you kind of go into, yeah, I'm going to get down, going to write more, going to play more? Because I saw you online with Mel May actually doing some online stuff as well. Yeah, well, I mean, if that was, there was no, to be honest, like everyone, the lockdown, you had to take it as it, as it came. Um, we didn't know how long it was going to be. Uh, we, I wanted to do an online gig anyway, because I had a gig planned and, you know, it's been, well, I can't remember the last time it was the St. Patrick's Day and that I wasn't on stage. Um, so me and Imelda decided to do a live gig and we thought we'll do half an hour of a few songs because everyone's feeling a bit blue. Because for a while, uh, the, the, because lockdown felt like it was going to be for two weeks or however long they said, maybe a month, it felt like St. Patrick's Day was the tragedy of it all. <laughs> and, yeah, and that, that very and much so. Isn't it a shame that of all the weeks of the year, COVID could fall on us that week? Because I remember when Dublin closed the day before St. Patrick's Day and I started getting really worried because I remember thinking, you think if it wasn't that bad, they'd go, we'll wait a day, get our money in, in the pubs and then we'll... Anyway, um, yeah, we did the gig and and uh, it became quite legendary, really. I can't, I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't see a world in which uh, I would would want to sit and watch a gig on a phone. And it shows you how the world has changed so much because people just did, and you know, it meant a lot to people. And then, and then for the weeks, probably a couple of months after it, if I'm honest, um, 
haven't spent years since I was 18 in London uh, trying to get acting jobs, getting acting jobs or working on the building sites or working, having my own van and just this constant pressure. Uh, I really enjoyed the first few weeks. I did nothing other than, if I'm honest, sit, drink as everyone did and just kind of took the time for what it was and tried not to worry too much about what it would mean in the future. Um, because luckily we'd had had a bit of money saved up from tickets and all that. But I felt very privileged in that sense because, uh, you know, my life wasn't going anywhere, but it wasn't falling apart either. So originally, yeah, it was, it was, it, I enjoyed the time. And then I started to think if this is going to be a good few months, I need to work out if I can sit down at a piano, plan to write a song and write one. And luckily I'd, I've had to force myself Norm, always in the past, if I was writing a song, um, I'd be out and about and I'd come in and I'd be in for a couple of hours and I might wander over to the piano or the guitar and write a song, but I, I never forced myself. So I had to learn how to do that because there was nothing going on. There was nothing to come back from. There was, wasn't many stories to write about. So um, luckily enough, I managed to write about 15 songs during lockdown that I'm happy with. And uh, I wouldn't have thought that before. It's strange, actually, when you mention like kind of forcing yourself to sit down because when you look at uh, people like uh, up in Denmark Street and the old like songwriting factories that Elton John was originally a part of that's what they did I know Monday to yeah. Friday nine to five that's what they did well to me I I, I, I know I, I understood that but for me I'd always had this because I'd only ever written songs in one way and I'd never decided how I was going to write it just seemed to be that I wouldn't plan to. One day I'd, something had happened to me or I'd get heartbroken or the football would go wrong or whatever. And and I'd end up just, ha- the song would happen to be written there. I know it sounds a bit arty-farty, but I really wouldn't plan it. So naturally I used to sort of think that if you sat down and planned to write a song and thought about the subject and really thought it through and it wasn't like this uh, magic that came upon you, that it wasn't real, that it, w- that it wasn't, um, wasn't legit. Um, so I had to get past that. And there's still a difference. I can definitely feel the difference between a song that just comes to me and a song that um, that that I've that I've had to think about and put work into to coming back to. Because my rule always before was if you if you haven't written a song, the full song within an hour, then you're never going to finish it. So I've had to change that rule, and and uh, maybe in hindsight that was just laziness. <laughs> It's I, I think it's a really interesting, really, really interesting subject because I think a lot of singer songwriters. Um, a lot of singer songwriters, if they're doing their own stuff, they're basically poets. You're basically a poet and you're writing your lyrics or yeah, you're writing your lyrics for you and the music that goes with that is for you. And if you're kind of forcing yourself, I've never heard of a poet making themselves sit down and write a song or write a poem. But Mm. if you're forcing yourself to do that, um, it has to bring that extra, I suppose, a change in mentality and a change of um, slight change of structure in how you're doing things, which probably then when you look at, again, the, the, the modern current hit factory, if you look like people at uh, Justin Trantner or people like that who write he writes for like people from Justin Bieber Selena Gomez Julia Michaels all these people they just like he's good at he's a really good guy and he is a talented guy he's a really talented guy I'm not good I've met him a few years ago and interviewed him a few years ago and he's a really talented guy but a lot of it just seems to be like you know churn 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 and when you're doing that for yourself, you want to make sure that at the same time you want to get your output up, but you don't want to turn it into something that isn't going to mean anything to you either. Exactly. It's it's uh, well, that's another thing as well is is that, um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I can't speak for loads of other songwriters or anything, but, um, you know, if I could if I had to write out a trajectory, I'd say for the first few years, I'd write a, a one song every few months. And, and it's definitely getting more. I think you get into a, a pattern of it. But also, um, yeah, again, that was part of the sort of feeling of I, I never wanted to have a song that 
some people I see release songs and they chat about it and they go, well, you know, it's 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 a good song, but it's not like, you know, it's it's a one you might like dancing to or or whatever. And there's always excuses. And I never had that with songs before. I always used to have this is a song. And and if I didn't think it was ready and really good and brilliant, then then I would no one would have heard it, you know, Um Whereas, I don't know, I'm branching out a little bit more now uh, and I feel like I, I can create uh, others. But there are, um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it, it was it was a good time to, to start learning how to, or to teach myself to, to sit and write about perhaps. Oh, no. Sorry. Uh, someone just called me. No worries. Um, it was a good time. It was a good time to uh, to teach myself to to sit and write about other things because <clears throat> I sort of had this feeling quite quickly that I didn't want to write songs about being in lockdown. Uh, not only because they'd only be, uh, you know, people would be going, "What's that about?" But also, I don't think people want to hear it. But then there's also the other thing of being in a love and relationship and going, mm, it's going to be hard to write about heartbreak now. And that was kind of my thing before. So I had to work on on that. Writing that happy songs. Element. Writing happy songs. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're, you're stuck with writing songs about who's doing the dishes and, and then there's going to be arguments and they're not going to be very good. So, um, so uh, funnily enough, the first song I released um as a single, and it's going to be on the EP. It's called Fish Pond, and that was almost a breakup song because that was a song about my friends who I've lived with for years in Tooting, and uh, just by chance, sort of around the time our tenancy was running out, and our era of living together with four, five lads for six years came to an end at the same time and it sort of got ripped away from me it's like right you gotta leave london right now the tense is done and you're like oh my god i'm a grown-up what's going on and luckily i could write that song it was the only breakup i've had in two years um from the boys and it felt like that so um yeah it was uh, that was a good start i suppose talking about the ep you've got a new ep coming out um it's coming out actually by the time this airs on Saturday, it will have been released yesterday. So happy release. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's a little, yeah, a little bit of a, a time warp, um, time travel there. Um, I can't believe we got to number one in the US overnight. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. No one saw that coming. <laughs> Speaking of number one, you do have a track there on um, a current number one album in, in Ireland. Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? So you yeah. have a duet, Don't Let Me Stand On My Own. Yeah, yeah. Tell uh, us about that. I mean, well, that song, uh, yeah, that, I, I can't believe that. Um, I mean, I'm so pleased for Imelda, first of all. I mean, I've never seen anyone work so hard and get and gets, you know, so little help in some ways uh, from from the industry and uh and, you know, there's been all that stuff on the radio recently uh, or talk about, you know, female artists being played compared to, to men in Ireland. And, um, you know, I, I've just seen her work so hard for such a long time and it's been pushed back because of the pandemic and all this sort of stuff. And she, she really got what she deserved getting to number one. And then to be on it with the duet is mental. I can't believe that. That was, uh, I mean, I started writing that probably a few months into me and Imelda being together. So 2019. And um, I don't remember where I was going or where I'd been, but I was in the house for about, again, as I was talking about songwriting earlier, I was in the house for probably about half an hour and I just sat on the guitar and I was just messing around and this tune came and the a few of the words and definitely the don't let me stand on my own, that chorus. And, you know, as a songwriter, you do that all the time. You know, you might record yourself playing something just so you can remember it. And for some reason, I sent it to Imelda and I said, I said, here, what do you think of this? And uh, she went, oh, it's great. You know, really liked it. And then I found myself around her house and and we just, she started singing along to it. And and I'd, I, <laughs> I, I don't know if maybe I was trying to be less romantic or something or trying to go in a new direction, but I definitely had a couple of, um, a couple of verses that were like anti-oil rig and anti-war and Amanda was kind of like it's all it's all good stuff Niall uh, I'm not sure for this song that might not, it's all great but uh, you know anti-love anti-fracking 
maybe you'll be Bob Dylan one day, but not on this song. And uh, and uh, and we started we started working on it together, and I was quite nervous. I think she was as well, um, because if it was, you know, I remember I was working on the song, going, God, if this is going anywhere, this could be terrible for us. <laughs> you know, if if this song does well, or if we decide to do anything with it then we don't know if we can work together yet and you know there'll mm. be a few stern words here and there of, you know uh because you know part of me's going this is amazing and part of me's going you know you shouldn't just just want to do a song with a melda because she's a melda you should this needs to be you know you'd be worrying you want to you both want to do it for the right reasons and uh luckily we we fought through it and um and we recorded a few different versions and eventually worked with tim brown who was doing the album and uh and uh we played it at a couple of gigs at the Irish Centre and a few of my gigs and it just got this it just got this reaction from people people seem to really love it and uh and then it just got to a point where there was no way we weren't going to do anything with it and god I was delighted for it to be on Amelda's album um and then of course because there's a couple of duets with Ronnie Wood, uh, Ronnie Woods on track on a track and Noel Gallagher and Miles Kane and Shola Moss and Gina Martin and uh, like even to be in that list regardless is is something special but there's something I can't really explain it's something very special about us having that as a couple um and for it not to feel too forced, you know. I didn't. I didn't want to be her Jordan to her uh, Peter Andre. Because <laughs> 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 you know I mean? <laughs> oh god, the light shining in my face here. And um, because I'm very aware. God, look at my the sun's. If anyone's watching this and thing, it's just the sun's caught my face. And um, <laughs> because I was very aware as well that that I didn't know if my stuff was going to be released at that point, and um, and I thought, oh, I just I hope I don't look like the the, there was a lot of pressure on me. I thought it better be good because if I'm not, I look like a Melda's fella who she's deciding to let play on her album. It's a big step. You know? It is a big it's, step. It's, it's terri- a It really step. is terrifying. I remember to play in the Irish Centre with her and you know Laura Whitmore and and um, and loads of people who you just know from the Irish scene were all there, and I'd never met any of them. I hardly knew Gary Dunn at the Irish Centre, and uh, I knew him a little bit, but just terrified because I'd never had to prove myself like that before. And there was that, I think maybe I'm the skeptical one, but if I was on the other side of it, watching it, I'd be going, <laughs> Oh, I hope he's good. Mm. Do you know? The, yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the, um, Jordan and Peter Andre thing was scaring the hell out of me. So you're releasing, you're, you're releasing your own EP now, step by step. Mm. What mm. have you learned about yourself and what can you take from what you've learned over the past year to put into this EP and to put into without even what have you learned about yourself so you can promote this better and promote you better if that makes sense mm. that's, a, that's a good question what have I learned mes- about myself during the lockdown um, well first of all uh, I'm, I keep dotting between two thoughts on, on this I love recording music i've always loved writing it i've always loved gigging but i've never got around to recording it partly because i think well if i if i record it and release it i want to get it to the right people i want it to be heard i don't want it to just be dying there on on spotify somewhere i want to do this right um and the other thing was just i didn't know how i didn't know anyone really um with a studio or or anything um so now i've recorded it and started recording quite often and i've been gigging a lot more part of me thinks god I, why didn't i do this earlier and then there's the other half of me that were, that says because you couldn't you know that this has come at the right time um i feel like i know myself really well now uh what have i learned about myself i've learned a lot I've, i definitely know myself better now and i think that that comes from 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 being with Amelda in many ways you know i've never uh spent so much time with someone that that tells me how how much they adore me, you know, or or is so kind, or or that I feel like I'm uh, useful to, you know. Um, I really feel like we're a really good team, and because I've been, I suppose, you know, the difference is I'm living with Imelda now, and uh, 
and I've not lived with a partner before. And uh, maybe she's the first partner I've been with where, you know, whether I want to or not, she knows me now exactly who I am. And um, I feel like that's probably helped a lot. Um, you know, we, we I mean, a couple of the things, I mean, I know this isn't about the album so much, but I used to have a real chip on my shoulder about going to school in Leicester. You know, when I'm such a big Dundalk fan and my family are there and, and feeling very... Um, almost like not worthy or like I had to prove myself to be Irish. And, and uh, I definitely don't don't feel that way anymore. Um, so were you born in the UK? I was, yeah, I was born in Leicester. And um, and I never really thought about it until I uh, moved to London because I was always the Irish kid in Leicester. But then, but then you go to London and you're going, hi, how's it going? And I know how I sound. And people are go, where are you from? And I go, Leicester. And they go, hang on. No, you're not. So, uh, yeah, there's that. And the other thing is, what have I learned about myself? It's such a good question. Yeah, I, I mean, I think being myself totally and feeling totally worthy to be myself and not have to do anything is has uh, is, is given me a real freedom and, uh, and made me understand what I want to do. I've been acting for so long and I still am. Um, but it's like I've missed out this whole chunk of recording and releasing. And as I said, it's come at the right time. I don't regret it. But uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 been. I don't I don't want to sound cocky about the lockdown, but in many ways, it's it's been done me the world of good, to be honest. The EP, as as you mentioned, um, we have step by step title track you already mentioned fish pond then and um china in a box um <laughs> the, these tracks are they're a really nice collection i think um and do you feel they're a stepping stone into progressing into an album or because it's really hard to judge how anything is going or how anything will go and as you say, a lot of people tend to put out singles at the moment, but singles can just get lost on Spotify. So if you have an album to hold, if you have an album to promote, it's an actual product rather than just something. A throwaway track. Cer- certainly. Um, I um, mu- The music industry is so strange. And, uh, you know, it's not at just best strange of times. because... I mean, yeah, there's there is... There is, it's part. I think, I think it's part of the reason why I, why I, I I did better in acting to start with when I wanted to do both is because with acting there's more of a the industry's more of a trajectory. You get an agent, then they get you an audition. You audition for it, and you either get it or you don't. And if you get it, you work, and then you get paid for doing it. And life is good pretty much. There are bad sides to the acting industry, of course, but that you know generally speaking, it's quite a clear trajectory. Whereas in music. It's anyone's guess, you know, even at the start with me manager, we were, you know, and people in the industry chatting to them, what should I do? Should I release a single? Should I release an album or an EP? Whatever that is. How many tracks should be on an EP? How many tracks should be on an album? How many singles should you do on an album? There's no answer to them. Um, and the worst thing is, is I've found in the industry already, and, and uh, you know, I'm sure a few people would agree with me on this, is that anyone who does something different to that, who does well off it, then the whole of the rest of the industry go, oh, let's do that. Like Lewis Capaldi, when he was doing all of his videos on YouTube and that was a whole unique thing. Then everyone started doing that. But he was the first one. And there would have been a point at which he said, I'll do this. And they would have gone, no. And he did it anyway. Um, the answer is to that is that, God, I if I could have done an album uh, and released it and had the time and the studio time and all that, then I would have, I would have done that if it was the right thing. I've got so many songs and in a way it was the most difficult thing was picking which ones were going to go on this on the um on the ep um you know i was i was doing a gig last year uh in february just before lockdown and uh not last year the year before god and um and you know we're, we're doing a set list of 18 songs that my crowd which has grown uh know all the words to and it was really hard to pick which songs to go on it. So I feel like I'm writing my sixth album and I've just released my first EP. So it's about, I quite like the idea of one day sitting down 
and writing an album from start to finish. Uh, but I've got a lot of songs to get through before that. Um, because I, I, you know, if I'm honest, I can't say that this EP is a is a journey within itself as some albums and EPs are. It's not a story. It's a collection of songs that step by step, which is the leading track in it. I wrote six or seven years ago and it's just stuck with me through um through uh, do you know what actually i'd stopped playing it and i played it so imelda uh, earlier when we were playing and she was like you need to keep that but i wrote it years ago and uh fish pond's really new five hours is probably eight years ago uh it's a mixture so where, where we go from here i don't know but i've written 15 during the lockdown and i had 20 before we started so i'm gonna have to start cutting the fat a little bit i think and, and seeing seeing what's next but um yeah step by step's a really important song to me and it was quite a risk putting it on the first ep because you know it's a very i feel like it's a massive strength of the ep and i think people will love it i really hope they do but then there's the also thing of you know you don't it might get me somewhere but then step by step might not be a thing in its own right it might never see the proper light of day so it's a bit of a risk and i've held back some brilliant songs uh, because I don't want to put all my good stuff on the first EP, but God, step by step, I, th- I think people will love it. And the music video we've we've got for it, which we filmed during lockdown, is one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. My mate Lee directs it. Uh, my mate Shoppe, who's uh, who was just nominated for the BAFTA a few weeks ago, Shoppe Derisu and Lauren Lyle from Outlander happily came and and did it for me. And uh, oh, I don't know if you've seen that yet. I'll have to send you the private link, but. Uh, I'm really excited about it and I really hope people like it. How, <clears throat> excuse me, how did you find when it's a music video as an actor for your oh. own music? <laughs> well, it's funnily enough, in Step by Step, uh, I decided I wouldn't be in that one. Uh, and uh, I I, <laughs> I, know, I know what you're asking. It, it was really, it's really strange. Because I, because I'm still employed to be in music videos as an actor. I was in the Melda's music video for um, uh, Just One Kiss because Noel Gallagher wasn't available, so we had to like get off in front of the camera. But then it just got lost in translation somewhere, unless people only listen to it. And I'd be getting messages going, "Fair play, Niall. He sounds mighty." <laughs> like, it's not me. I was trying to get Imelda to get Noel Gallagher to be in the music video for Don't Let Me Stand On My Own, just to shake it up. But um, yeah, it's very strange. I avoided being in the step-by-step music video because the music videos are changing. Oh, Gary's gone mad here. Um, Me dog. Sit. Uh, I avoided being in the music video just because, well, I'm a bit of an old man and I was told that it's quite trendy now to get two actors to just be in it and... uh, and so probably somewhere for that reason of not necessarily wanting to um to to mix the lines too much i'm in a i am in a couple of the music videos and there's we did a music video luckily for every track on the ep which is a bit unnecessary but i thought but still it's great and you know music and the way people listen to music it is a visual medium as well as something that you listen to Definitely. And if I have the time and or, or the, the means in some way, I think I'll make a video for every song I do just because I've got. So, I mean, I'm so lucky to have been working as an actor for seven or eight years because I've just got so many good friends and people who want to make stuff. People who are directors, costume uh, actors, musicians. There's, there's a huge amount of people who are happy to make stuff with me. And especially during lockdown, people were just eager to, to, to help out and, and do whatever. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to make a, I really would like to commit to making a visual for everything. Really. really. Um, it is fun. And, there's part of me that's getting me director boots on and, you know, I, I'm trying not to be a control freak about it. And I generally am pretty good at that, but there would be a point at which, you know, I want to do everything at some level. I love directing. I love writing. I love acting. I love music. Um, it's a big ask, but I'd like to do all of them really, you know. Talking about acting, um, I believe you have a starring role in an upcoming feature, Love Without Walls. Tell us about that. 
I do. That's, I mean, I mean, it's, it, I, as I'm talking about this, it either sounds like I'm bragging or that I've just been very lucky, but um, God, love without walls. I, I'm so, so thankful to be working on that. I, I go, actually, the day that, uh, by the time this is out or the day, day the song gets released, I'll be on my way back into London and uh, sort of quarantining in a mini way in a hotel for a few days before we start filming. Um, there was a little gap uh, probably about this time last year, was it June or July, where we probably got the closest uh, to being out of lockdown as we are getting mm, to now. Yeah. The, the pubs were open. You could be indoors. It was table service, but there's a bit of live music on. Um, as you know, I, I, regardless of my own gigs and playing uh, ticketed events and with my name on the board, I've always made a living in London playing gigs in pubs in the corner and Irish pubs. And I was playing a gig in... I got offered to come to London to do a gig, I think for the bank holiday in Feelys in, in Clapham. Little tiny grey old pub. Look looks like a, a piece of a I'd love to film in there. It looks it looks like it from a different time in the best kind of way. And I was doing a gig in there and God, I, I invite I said to a few people, I'm doing this gig because I've not seen anyone in ages. And 60 people turned up, which never happens for a little gig in a pub. And uh Oh, sorry, I've gone off topic a little bit. Anyway, I'll bring it back to the topic. Um, a lady came up to me uh, and I was worried she might be uh, police, like we might have stepped at a line because it was getting a bit crowded outside there. And, you know, you didn't want to push it. Not that I had anything to do with it. And uh, I said, hi. And she went, um, hi, I was going to get in touch with your agent, but, um, but I saw you were doing a gig, so I thought I'd come down. And her name was Jane Gull and she's the director for Love Without Walls. And... Um, she said, I, I've written a script. It's about a couple who fall in hard times. Um, Gary, cut it out. Who fall in hard times and, uh, you know, they become homeless and there's a whole story in there. And, you know, she's been, I'd love you to read the script, but the reason I want to talk to you about it is because the leading role, the leading male role in it, of the couple, is um, is a singer-songwriter. And uh, not only would, you know, we'd maybe be interested in you being in it, but we'd also love if your songs were the soundtrack. And, uh, you know, I don't need to tell many actors or musicians that that's a bit of a dream offer, really. So uh, I don't know if she thought that I was going to be a bit more cautious with it or go, oh, well, you know, you talk to my people and I'll talk. I was like, yeah, OK, <laughs> definitely. Let's have a chat. And um, so we, we, we agreed to sort of, get chatting about it and I went in a red with Shanna Swash who used to be in EastEnders and uh, is Joe Swash's sister she's excellent so free as an actress and uh and we just clicked and it, and I I started getting nervous then because I thought this has worked out far too well this is definitely not going to happen we were meant to be filming it in August and then of course it got pushed back because we're filming the end of the movie at the start I'm growing a beard and my hair and trying to lose weight and and then it got pushed back again and then it was going to be December and I, I'm getting skinny and growing a beard and then it getting cancelled and getting fat and shaven every like two months. And finally, finally, we're filming starting next week. And uh, I'm sorry if that was long winded, but I'm just so buzzing about it. And you get told you do some really good auditions or you work so hard in acting and in music and get pushed back. So for someone like Karen, the director, and Jane. It's a team run by women, and they're fantastic. And my life should be run by women. My agent, my actors, my manager, they're all brilliant. And for them to just put their faith in me and say, we love the songs and we, we really like you and, and, and this should work out and we want you to be in it. I, God, it makes me want to cry, really, because to have films are, are big work and they're expensive. So to put their faith in me like that, I, God, I, I can't thank them enough, really. I'm, I can't wait to get started. It's going to be fun. <laughs> it sounds fantastic. And the way you describe film work, it is like one great big team. And like, it's a lot on your shoulders, too. When when you are the like the lead role, the lead male role and mm. your tunes, it it's kind of like if you were doing one, Fair enough. If you were doing the other, fair enough. But put to do the two together and it's like, holy. Am I allowed to yeah. say it on the radio? But you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, it's it's it is terrifying. 
which is a good thing. You know, I don't I don't work very well when when I feel too uh, relaxed or I was I would always get nervous before I go on stage if I wasn't nervous. Do you know what I mean? Because you need that adrenaline. Um, yeah, you need to my keep, you need to keep on your toes so you have just that little bit of a faster reaction if something did happen to go wrong. I think. Totally. My, my head uh, is totally in the game for it now. Um, uh, it, something just clicked a few weeks ago. I spent so long with the script, not wanting to look at it because I'd be terrified or, you know, when something just scares you enough or you don't. And then I read it one day and I was like, wow, this is going to be a great film. And, and then I've been stuck in it ever since. So uh, I can't really wait to get started. But, uh, oh, well, th- actually, that's a good point. Uh, one of the things in the time when we were, uh, meant to be uh, starting filming and, and it got pulled back. Um, they said to me, look, it, it, it's it's fine for us to not film this for a bit, but once we're up and running, if something happens in the middle of it and we have to stop, it's going to kill us, basically. So they said, but we can do one day. They said, why don't we, uh, why don't we film the mu- music video for China in a box, but set it as the movie, uh, like sort of like a teaser. So we had we spent a day together filming that, and when we released China in a Box, which is also on the EP, that came out. And God, you could just tell me and Shana work so well together. Me and Jane, there's no big heads in there. Everyone's really open and willing to take suggestion and the uh, and and to give it. And it feels like a really equal set. Which uh, I know some people in acting and. And so they always comment on how nice a team is. And generally speaking, teams are nice, but there's always a hierarchy. I'm always terrified of directors. Always. I don't know if it's a schoolboy thing of not getting on with teachers or something, <laughs> or maybe not feeling, maybe, or maybe they picked the wrong person. Or, But I don't have that with Jane. We keep in touch all the time and are talking about it. And it feels like our project, you know, not something that I'm just in. And I think that works really well for me. Uh, and that's why there's no there's no personal fear, which I love. I know that sounds a bit daft, but um, the fear is all about the actual work. When, when often for me, I'm never worried about how it comes across on stage or on screen. But my worry is, <laughs> do the other people like me, or 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 do we get on, or do I seem like a bit of a an idiot here, or a bit daft? But uh, it just feels like we're already a family, so and we've not even started. So it's great. <laughs> Niall, it's been absolutely fascinating and fantastic chatting to you. Thank you for being so open. You, uh, you you've been so open. If if you say that you've been, I suppose, learning about yourself in the past year and you're happy with who you are, that has definitely shown today. So thank you for being so yeah. open. It, it's great to, because uh, as well as everything else, not a lot of blokes are that open in interviews. Um, you know but thank you for for laying everything bare for us it's been a pleasure Um, if people want to find out more about you more about your acting and more about Step by Step the EP including the launch and all this kind of stuff and your gigs where can they go what can they do how can they find you uh, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or I've got a website nilemcnamee.com um it's not the easiest name to spell, but I'm sure people will find it. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd say Instagram would be the best place, but I'm I'm on all of it and I'll keep all the updates coming. The EP is out Friday the 14th of May. The music video should be out, I think, the 26th of May. And then there's plenty going on after that with the EP. And then I've actually got, unbelievably, the first or my first for a while totally... Uh, not socially distanced, full capacity gig at uh, Nels in London on the 25th of June. I think that's right. Um, but yeah, they can follow me on all, all those online uh, things. And uh, yeah, I'll be there and I'll keep everyone updated. And I hope people like it, you know. Niall, thanks a million again. And say hello to Gary there. And, <laughs> and uh, best of luck with the EP. Thanks so much for having me.